I'm uh, Gregory Murad, uh, an assistant professor of neurosurgery at the University of Florida um, and the director of Neurotrauma Quality. Um, I'm here today to talk about mild traumatic brain injury and mass casualty incidents and approach to emergency care. Uh, this is an update of clinical practice guidelines. Other faculty reviewers for this presentation include David Oconquo, clinical director of the Brain Trauma Research Center at the University of Pittsburgh, as well as Stephen Lewis, uh, the James and Newton Eblen Eminent Scholar in Cerebrovascular Surgery at the University of Florida. Uh, special thanks is given to Dr. Linda Papa, uh, who originally developed this presentation and is now an adjunct professor of emergency medicine at the University of uh, Florida College of Medicine and practices in Orlando, Florida. The goal of today's presentation uh, and this educational curriculum is to improve the acute care of patients who have suffered a closed head injury and may have suffered a mild traumatic brain injury. This curriculum seeks to educate healthcare professionals for the management issues related to mild TBI on a daily basis and in the event of a mass casualty occurrence, specifically related to blast injury. The learning objectives uh, during this curriculum uh, include the clinical importance, epidemiology, and pathophysiology of mild traumatic brain injury, otherwise known as MTBI, classification of MTBI, MTBI in the setting of a mass casualty occurrence with specific attention to blast injuries, the acute indications for neuroimaging after MTBI, evidence-based guidelines for the acute management of MTBI, the acute and post-acute treatment strategies for those with MTBI, directions of future research on or about MTBI, and community resources that are available for patients and families in the state of Florida uh, who have suffered this injury. During today's presentation, again, we'll be using many abbreviations. Uh, some of these abbreviations I'll be listing now. These include TBI, meaning traumatic brain injury, MTBI, or mild traumatic brain injury, ED, or emergency department, CT, computed tomography, GCS, which is the Glasgow Coma Scale, PCS, or post-concussion or concussive syndrome, EMS, emergency medical services, and PTA, or post-traumatic amnesia. Many different terms have been used to describe brain injury uh, and can be somewhat confusing. Uh, these include mild, minor, minimal, grade one, class one, and low risk. The terms head and brain have been used interchangeably. However, head injury and traumatic brain injury are two distinct entities. A head injury is clinically evident on the physical exam and is recognized by the presence of ecchymosis, lacerations, deformities, or cerebrospinal fluid leakage, whereas a traumatic brain injury refers specifically to an injury to the brain itself and is defined as an alteration in brain function or other evidence of brain pathology caused by an external force. Uh, this definition was actually a consensus definition reached by a conference of neurotraumatologists uh, in 2010 in hopes of better clarifying the treatment of TBI. According to Florida statute, traumatic brain injury is an insult to the skull, brain, or its covering resulting from external trauma which produces an altered state of consciousness or anatomic, motor, sensory, cognitive, or behavioral deficit. TBI has been noted to be a, quote, silent epidemic. Approximately 5.7 million Americans are currently report living with the effects of TBI. Uh, of these, uh, 2 million sustain a TBI of all severities each year. Uh, about 80 to 90 percent of these 2 million, however, are, quote, mild. About 1 million of these people will eventually experience at least short-term disability. Uh, the actual proportion living with the effects of mild TBI are likely underestimated. This is due to underreporting a focus of trauma centers on severe TBI, which is easier to define, uh, and has thus led to this term of a, quote, silent epidemic. Uh, notably, in the state of Florida, there are over 400,000 patients currently living with the effects of TBI, and about 90,000 per year are diagnosed with mild TBI. And why have mild TBI cases been underestimated? The focus, again, has been on severe TBI. Uh, data taken from trauma centers, referral centers, and pre-existing data sets and ICD-9 codes are much better related to dealing with severe traumatic brain injury. Uh, many patients who suffer traumatic brain injury, especially mild TBI, 
do not seek immediate medical attention, believing that they have not suffered a severe injury and that their symptoms will be self-limited. A lack of educational re and rehabilitation programs specific to MTBI also limits what data we have about MTBI cases. There has, however, been a new interest in mild TBI, especially with relation to sports. Sports-related concussion has become a prominent news topic. Data from injuries suffered in college and professional athletes, especially in the National Football League, has shed light on the effects of chronic and repeated mild TBI. Blast injuries related to combat operations in Iraq, the Middle East, and Afghanistan are also becoming evident, and treating soldiers returning from the battleground uh, has led to renewed interest in mild TBI. Study for treatment of all of these patients is ongoing. The epidemiology of mild TBI is wide-ranging. 1.4 million emergency department visits are experienced annually for mild TBI in the U.S. and approximately 90,000 for mild TBI in the state of Florida. The highest incidence of MTBI in male is in males aged 15 to 24 years and in both genders aged greater than 75 years. In Florida specifically, MTBI is much more common in those aged 65 and greater, likely related to the aged population of our state. The top mechanisms of injury are motor vehicle accidents, falls, assaults, and sports-related injuries. A key point, 80 to 90 percent of all TBI in the United States is considered mild. We are likely underestimating the actual numbers of MTBI cases. And disability from MTBI is overshadowed by more severe TBI and thus is a silent epidemic. There exist two periods of time when related to MTBI. These include the acute sequelae of MTBI, which can be defined as actual macroscopic injury to the brain resulting in intracranial bleeding and is often identified by neuroimaging. The incidence of this is fairly small, ranging from 3 to 13 percent, and fewer than 1 percent of these patients will need neurosurgical intervention. This acute period is well defined and well studied. The long-term sequelae of MTBI involves impaired daily functioning and must be identified oftentimes by neuropsychosocial or neuropsychological assessment. The incidence of this long-term dysfunction is unknown and estimated at anywhere from 7 to as much as 30 percent. This time period is poorly defined and more studies are needed to define this population. The diagnostic criteria for MTBI are also at times controversial. A formal definition for MTBI adopted from the American Congress of Rehabilitation, Rehabilitative Medicine uh, was designated in 1993. This includes blunt trauma to the head with at least one of the following. Any period of loss of consciousness or LOC of less than 30 minutes and a GCS score of 13 to 15 after this period of LOC. Any loss of memory of the event immediately before or after the accident with post-traumatic amnesia of less than 24 hours. And any alteration in mental state at the time of the accident, such as feeling dazed, disoriented, or confused. When grading mild TBI, historically MTBI has been referred to as a concussion. In 1997, the American Academy of Neurologists graded concussions into three categories. These include grade one, which involves transient confusion, no loss of consciousness, and mental status abnormalities on exam that resolve in less than 15 minutes. Uh, this may also include associated symptoms such as nausea and headache. Grade two concussion includes transient confusion, again, no loss of consciousness, and mental status abnormalities or symptoms on exam that resolve in more than 15 minutes. A grade three concussion involves any loss of consciousness, either brief or prolonged. And this was published in the American Academy of Neurology Concussion Guidelines in 1997. One of the most widespread scales used in identifying traumatic brain injury is the Glasgow Coma Scale. Uh, this is most often used for classifying the severity of TBI. This 15-point standardized clinical scale rates patients' best eye-opening, motor, and verbal responses. It was created by Jeanette and Teasdale in Scotland in 1974. Initially, it was developed to facilitate inter-observer assessments of comatose head injury patients. The Glasgow Coma Scale is not designed to diagnose mild or moderate TBI. Although GCS score of 13 to 15 refers to MTBI, 
a single GCS score is of limited prognostic value. Serial GCS scores are much more important. The GCS score, again, is based on three separate categories. These include eye opening. Eye opening would be a four for spontaneous eye opening, three eye opening to verbal command, two eye opening to pain, and one no eye opening. The verbal score is out of five points, and this includes a five for someone who is oriented times three and converses, a four for a patient who is disoriented but is still conversant, a three for someone with inappropriate words such as ex exclamations or random speech, two for incomprehensible sounds such as moaning, and one for no response. Notably, patients who have an endotracheal tube in place are delineated by a one T as they cannot speak due to the presence of the endotracheal tube. The motor score is out of six. This includes a score of six for someone who obeys verbal commands, a five they localize to pain, a four in that they withdraw to painful stimuli, three they have abnormal flexion or decorticate posturing, two they have extensor posturing or decerebrate rigidity, and one no movement. Thus the score of a GCS scale score ranges from three to fifteen. Key point when using the GCS in MTBI patients it is not just a single score, but serial determinations, which are most important for assessing the patient clinically. The pathophysiology of MTBI uh, can be either focal, diffuse, or a combination of both. The degree of injury to the brain depends on the mechanism and magnitude of force, secondary insults, and genetic and molecular responses to trauma. Preventable secondary insults include hypoxia, hypotension, hyper or hypocarbia, hyperthermia, hyponatremia, hyperexcitability, and hyper or hypoglycemia. The pathophysiology of secondary brain injury can be depicted in this graphic as attempting to reduce secondary insults. This hopefully will reduce progressive damage associated with the injury itself. The key point in pathophysiology is that we can reduce secondary injury caused by these seven H's, hypoxia, hypotension, hyper or hypocarbia, hyperthermia, hyponatremia, hyperexcitability, hyper or hypoglycemia through diligent medical care. Notably, we are not able to fix the initial trauma, but hopefully we can limit secondary injuries related to these known factors. Focal brain injuries are usually from direct blows to the head and include contusions, brain lacerations, and hemorrhage leading to the formation of a hematoma in the extradural, subarachnoid, subdural, or intracerebral compartments within the skull. The following are going to be four examples of different pathologies seen on head CT. First is epidural hematoma. In this image, we see a lenticular classic shape of the extradural hematoma that is compressing the brain and causing midline shift. Next, we see a subdural hematoma. Rather than being lenticular in shape, this hematoma is panhemispheric, covering the entire right hemisphere. This causes a significant amount of mass effect and greater than two centimeters of midline shift of the midline structures in the brain and brain herniation. Next is traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. Seen here is the hyperdense hemorrhage within the sulci and gyri related to a motor vehicle accident. And last is cerebral contusion. Cerebral contusion often occurs when the brain is accelerated rapidly into the hard bony prominences of the skull, leading to actual hemorrhage formation within the brain parenchyma. Here we see a picture of bifrontal contusions. The most likely spots for brain contusion include the frontal lobes as well as the tips of the temporal lobes due to the anatomy of the skull. Diffuse axonal injury is often not seen on imaging. Shear forces or rotational forces in the brain are created by sudden acceleration and deceleration. Pathologic studies show microscopic lesions in the brain following even mild TBI.
The earliest lesions that are detectable, usually less than eight hours after injury, include microglial cell proliferation and petechial hemorrhages. Following this, hours later, axonal disruption will occur. Uh, this occurs in response to secondary events in the axonal membrane and cytoskeleton. The second impact syndrome has also been identified in patients after mild TBI. In this, repeated mild TBI occurring within hours, days, or weeks can be catastrophic or fatal. This is a rare but important phenomenon, especially in athletes and in those patients such as soldiers who are going to be uh, exposed to dangerous forces in the near future. The risk appears most increased in athletes who have prematurely returned to play, have prolonged loss of consciousness or post-traumatic amnesia, or persistent neuropsychological deficits following their mild TBI. Notably, patients who have returned to play too soon are those who have most likely been injured by this phenomenon. And thus, return to play guidelines have been developed and are also in the process of being validated. The pathophysiology of primary blast injuries is very similar to the injuries caused by TBI. Neuropathological changes caused by blast-generated pressure waves and injuries in a study of hunted whales showed that an explosion near the vicinity of the brain resulted in trauma similar to severe TBI, similar to a direct blow to the head. Explosions in more distant areas resulted in injuries resembling acceleration-induced diffuse TBI, or DAI. Widespread activation of microglia is consistent with neuronal degeneration and has been also noted in rat blast injury models. This all leads to the conclusion that blast injury is a very high risk for resulting in TBI, both mild and severe. In the acute evaluation of a patient with a suspected mild TBI, there are many steps. Step one includes gathering information. This includes information from bystanders or observers about the mechanism of injury, EMS personnel, ambulance reports, the family, and the patient, him or herself, if they are lucid. We must ask about the mechanism of injury, presence or absence of loss of consciousness, amnesia surrounding the event and to time periods within the 24 hours before the event, confusion or disorientation, the initial GCS score, and presence of drugs or alcohol in the system. For, in general, for trauma, all patients should be evaluated by standard ATLS protocol. We must, however, keep a high index of suspicion for mild TBI in multi-trauma, as many patients will suffer from an MTBI in this setting. A small proportion of suspected MTBIs deteriorate and do require neurosurgical intervention. And anecdotally, this number may be higher in those suffering from blast injury, as the injury to the brain has been shown to be more extensive with more hyperemia and swelling in the brain in combat situations. Key point, in an individual with multi-system trauma, healthcare providers must keep a high index of suspicion for MTBI as a concomitant injury, since other bodily injuries will serve to distract from potential head injuries. We must be aware of the dangerous phenomenon of patients who, quote, talk and deteriorate. The key to salvaging these patients is to identify these patients early before they deteriorate. Mild TBI and mass casualty incidents. When categorizing mass casualty or terrorist incidents, one acronym that has been used is Be Nice. This includes biological, nuclear, incendiary, chemical, and explosive. MTBI may occur in any mass casualty situation, but especially at high risk during explosive incidents or from blast injury. There's a tragic potential for large and small-scale terrorist violence in our community. As we have learned from bombings at the Oklahoma City Federal Building, at the Atlanta Olympic Park, at the World Trade Centers in 1993, and subsequently related to the 9-11 uh, tragedy, uh, terrorist violence has a high potential to injure civilian populations. Treatment must be initiated at the site and in hospital emergency departments, likely at the closest facilities first.
Transportation for these patients is based on a triage system and maybe by air, by ground, or even on foot depending on where accidents or uh, terrorist violence occurs. Of the injuries uh, of survivors of terrorist bombings, head injuries are among the most common. Other common injuries of survivors include lacerations, contusions, fractures, abrasions, and soft tissue foreign bodies. Blast injury data from survivors of terrorist bombings is limited, although more, in, more data is now available due to the conflicts in the Middle East and Iraq where numerous blast injuries have occurred. Study of casualties from terrorist bombings over a 12-year period, 78% of the fatalities died at the scene and 13% died within 24 hours. Trauma to the head and brain are the most significant cause of death at the scene of these bombings. Most fatalities from head injury do occur within the first few hours of the incident. And autopsies of blast injury victims show that two-thirds had brain injuries, approximately half had skull fractures, and almost half had ruptures of the tympanic membrane associated with the pressure wave from the blast. A simple method to triage patients after a mass casualty incident uh, was postulated by Bozeman in 2003. This is, quote, the START method. This is a simple triage and rapid treatment. Patients are initially given color designations, including green, yellow, and red. If the patient is able to walk, they are green and directed to a treatment area. If they are unable to walk, we use the RPM method. This includes respirations, pulse, and mental status. A patient designated yellow has respirations less than 30, has a pulse, and can follow simple commands. This is a radial pulse. A patient labeled red has respirations greater than 30 or no pulse or cannot follow simple commands. Patients labeled black have no spontaneous breathing. Once any patient has a red criteria, the patient should be tagged and move on to continue triage. Again, triage is not treatment. Only two interventions should be made during this triage period. These include opening or clearing an airway or applying direct pressure to a major bleeding site. This is a graphical representation of the START method along with the RPM method for triage of mass casualty. Again, patients are triaged into either a green where they are, quote, the walking wounded, and if they are unable to walk, they are either red, yellow, or black based on respirations, radial pulse, and mental status. Key point, triage is critical in a mass casualty incident setting. Triage is sorting and not treatment. The START approach is a simple and useful way to do this using respirations, pulse, and mental status, which can be easily and rapidly calculated. Imaging for mild TBI. Acutely, imaging modalities for head injury include MRI and CAT scan. Skull x-rays are no longer indicated for trauma and are actually rarely used. The question becomes then using a CT scan versus MRI scan. MRI is more sensitive for certain findings than CT scan. It can detect lesions that may indicate higher risk of post-concussive syndrome, such as DAI. CT, however, is more sensitive for hyperacute and acute intracranial hemorrhage, as well as skull fractures. CT is quicker, easier, and less expensive. Thus, MRI is not indicated acutely at this time for TBI. CT is the imaging modality of choice until the role of MRI in the acute evaluation of MTBI can be determined. As CT is the mainstay of diagnosis of brain injury and neurotrauma, the next question that arises is who needs a CT scan? So why should we develop a guideline for selective use of CT and MTBI? There's considerable disagreement on indications for CT and suspected MTBI. The incidence of brain injury and need for intervention, as previously mentioned, is very low. Less than 1% of MTBI patients have neurosurgical lesions, and any intracranial lesion is only present between 3 and 13% of the time. There's a large variation in one study of physician CT ordering patterns, the range of ordering CT for MTBI went from 7 to as much as 
and the costs of CT scanning and the dangers of radiation associated with medical imaging are not negligible. Uh, this has certainly come to light more recently with increased risk of cancer related to diagnostic imaging. In order to answer the question of which patients do actually need a head CT and MTBI, Haydel et al. looked at 1,400 patients. Uh, they established what's called the New Orleans criteria. Uh, using these seven criteria of headache, vomiting, age greater than 60 years, drug or alcohol intoxication, persistent anterograde amnesia, trauma above the clavicle, or seizure, uh, the absence of all seven of these criteria had a 100% negative predictive value. Thus, for patients not eliciting these signs, uh, no head CT was indicated. Similarly, Steele et al. used the Canadian CT head rule. Uh, they also uh, had a, a different criteria to decide which patients were high risk for neurological intervention. These include GCS score less than 15 at two hours after the injury, suspected open or depressed skull fracture, any sign of basal skull fracture, vomiting greater than two episodes, or age greater than 65 years. Medium risk for brain injury included post-traumatic amnesia of greater than 30 minutes and dangerous mechanism of injury, including pedestrian struck by motor vehicle, occupant ejected from a motor vehicle, fall from a height greater than three feet, or greater than five stairs. Uh, they studied more than 3,000 patients and had a similar uh, negative predictive value of close to 100%. The key point shows that evidence-based guidelines recommend that a head CT is indicated in those patients with loss of consciousness or post-traumatic amnesia and one or more of the following. Headache, vomiting, age greater than 60 years, drug or alcohol intoxication, short-term memory deficits, exam evidence of trauma above the clavicle, seizure, GCS score less than 15, focal neurologic deficit, and coagulopathy. And this was published as a clinical policy guideline by the American College of Emergency Physicians in 2008. The next question involves CT scans in children. There are no official evidence-based guidelines as of yet. In 1999, the American Academy of Pediatrics developed a practice guideline for the evaluation and management of MTBI in children. They recognized that the literature did not provide a sufficient scientific basis for evidence-based recommendations. Their recommendations applied only to children with isolated MTBI and evaluation within 24 hours after the injury, normal mental status, normal neurologic examination, and history of no more than a brief, meaning less than one minute, loss of consciousness. Thus, this did not cover most children. They suggested that if these criteria are not met, children may require observation and or a CT scan. Unfortunately, these guidelines have not yet been updated. Because of the extra risks for children, especially with relation to uh, therapeutic or diagnostic radiation, other physicians have attempted to identify children at low risk for clinically important brain injuries. Kupperman et al. studied 8,000 children under the age of two years after mild TBI. Those with normal mental status, loss of consciousness five seconds or less, and no palpable hematoma, as well as non-severe injury mechanism, and were acting normally per their parents, had a sensitivity of 100% and negative predictive value of 100% for having a clinically important brain injury. Thus, those patients were not recommended to undergo CT scanning. They subsequently validated this in over 2,000 patients. For children greater than two years of age, Kupperman et al. studied more than 20,000 patients. Again, for patients with normal mental status, no loss of consciousness, no vomiting, a non-severe injury mechanism, no signs of basal or skull fracture, and no severe headache, the negative predictive value was almost 100%. Again, so children not evincing any of these six signs had no indication for receiving head CT. This was subsequently uh, prospectively evaluated in more than 2,000 patients. Osmond et al. similarly evaluated a decision rule for head CT and pediatric TBI. 
This was a retrospective review of nearly 4,000 pediatric patients to evaluate clinically important indicators for head injury and need for CT scanning. They developed the CATCH rule, or Canadian Assessment of Tomography for Childhood Head Injury, based on seven parameters similar to those studied by Kupperman et al. The outcome, as defined by Osmet et al., was the need for neurologic intervention. And again, sensitivity approached 100% and specificity 70%, although this was not validated prospectively. The catch decision rules include indication for CT if Glasgow coma score less than 15 at two hours after injury, suspected open or depressed skull fracture, history of worsening headache, irritability on examination. Those at a medium risk of brain injury included any sign of basal skull fracture, large boggy hematoma of the scalp, or dangerous mechanism of injury, including motor vehicle crash, fall from elevation greater than three feet or five stairs, or fall from a bicycle with no helmet. The next question that then arises is, can a patient with MTBI be safely discharged from the emergency department if no evidence of acute injury is found on CT? The American College of Emergency Physicians addressed this in their clinical policy guideline in 2008. They recommended the following. Patients with isolated MTBI and a negative head CT are at minimal risk for developing an intracranial lesion and may be safely discharged from the emergency department. This guideline does not include patients with bleeding disorders who are on anticoagulation or who have prior neurosurgical procedures. We will next discuss the post-concussive or post-concussion syndrome. Mild TBI after discharge is often undertreated. Most MTBI patients are treated and released from the ED with basic discharge instructions and no follow-up care. Most patients appear unimpaired. Unfortunately, a significant minority of these patients have incomplete recoveries. They may begin to experience post-concussive symptoms and functional problems in the days or weeks after their injury. These include neurologic symptoms such as headache, episodic diplopia, or dizziness, cognitive problems with attention and memory or executive dysfunction, emotional problems including anxiety, depression, or irritability, or problems with daily functioning including inability to return to work, problems with sleep, or problems with appetite. The post-concussive syndrome has been long recognized. However, in the early 20th century, it was initially viewed as somatization disorder. Research does indicate that PCS is more likely a multifactorial disorder with physical, neurological, and psychological, as well as psychiatric factors. PCS has been documented in up to 50% of MTBI patients. So the post-concussive syndrome may surface within days or even weeks following the mild TBI. There's a variability in both the degree and duration of these symptoms, although most patients do have gradual resolution of their PCS symptoms. There does exist long-term disability associated with MTBI. Depending on how disability is defined, as many as 15% of patients with MTBI will have compromised function one year after injury. This may result in lifelong impairment of physical, cognitive, and psychosocial functioning. Neuropsychological and physical sequelae of MTBI are more subtle and difficult to assess than moderate or severe TBI. Rehabilitation after mild head injury has been largely ignored. Treatment protocols for MTBI have slowly begun to emerge and are still experimental. Again, the injury is often seen as mild. Therefore, therapies have not been developed to treat patients suffering after MTBI. Therapies for moderate or severe TBI are assumed to be inappropriate for MTBI. Although no, no formal standards of care have been developed to treat PCS, preliminary data suggests that neuropsychological, cognitive behavioral treatment, and other rehabilitation strategies may be efficacious in reducing post-injury sequelae and subsequently improve functional outcome. Notably, it has been studied that patients at higher risk for PCS include those with pre-morbid psychiatric problems, older age, and lower socioeconomic status. We do need studies of early and comprehensive intervention. Some opportunities for discharge from the emergency department 
include prescribing verbal and written explanations about why symptoms may persist after a mild TBI, providing a self-help manual, giving access to a therapist for a brief assessment to discuss the patient's injury and expected, expected symptoms, and discussing and providing access to community resources once discharged. Another study from the American College of Emergency Physicians showed that fewer than 10% of ERs were able to provide excellent care for MTBI patients after discharge. Repeated MTBI over months or years can result in cumulative neurologic and cognitive deficits. As we mentioned earlier, repeated MTBI over hours, days, or weeks can be catastrophic or fatal due to the second impact syndrome. Recent high-profile cases in the National Football League, as well as in college football, show a diagnosis of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE. This is thought to be related to multiple blows to the head and may lead to problems with depression, dementia, or cognitive loss. When to return a concussed athlete or worker to participation, specifically uh, soldiers, is highly controversial. The risk of complications has been shown to be increased in those who have prematurely returned to participation, had prolonged loss of consciousness or post-traumatic amnesia, and persistent neuropsychological deficits following their MTBI. Again, guidelines are being developed in order to return to play for specific patients or return to work uh, for those with more dangerous jobs. So treatment of patients with MTBI and TBI in general will require a multidisciplinary team. This includes neurologists, neuropsychologists, rehabilitation specialists, social workers, community resources, and specifically in the state of Florida, the Brain Injury Association. In summary, when dealing with mass casualty, mass casualty protocols and hazardous material protocols should be followed. Triage can be undertaken using the START method with the green, yellow, red, and black for tagging patients. Patients should be transported to the nearest emergency department and subsequently can be triaged to level one trauma centers if necessary. The ATLS protocol should be followed. Repeated GCS scores should be recorded in order to follow patients over time. We can use clinical guidelines for the use of CT scan and subsequently upon discharge can maximize patient's treatment and follow-up care. In terms of future research, outcomes in patients after MTBI has been ineffectively and inadequately studied and are lacking. Future research must address mechanisms for identifying patients at risk, especially those for risk for post-concussive syndrome, reliable assessment instruments, interventions to minimize or prevent disability, MTBI-specific outcome measures to define dysfunction, and especially in the future, blood tests such as serum biomarkers, which may have markers of injury severity and response to therapy, and specific new forms of MRI such as diffusion tensor imaging, which may again shed light on post-concussive syndrome and patients at risk for this problem. New therapies and interventions also need to be developed. These include neurobehavioral interventions, pharmacologic treatment, rehabilitation treatment, prevention of injury and secondary injury, education, and community supports and services. In the state of Florida, Florida Statute 381 requires all hospitals to report moderate to severe traumatic brain injuries to the Brain and Spinal Cord Injury Central Registry at the Florida Department of Health. Individuals referred should have an initial GCS score of between 3 and 12. The toll-free reporting line for the Central Registry is 1-800-342-0778. This covers patients with moderate to severe traumatic brain injury and not those with mild traumatic brain injury. Resources for individuals with GCS 13 to 15 and their families can be obtained by contacting the Brain Injury Association of Florida at the Family Helpline at 1-800-992-3442. This is an example of a TBI or head injury fact sheet which is available at the website of the Brain Injury Association of Florida uh, which can give detailed information about
signs and symptoms of a moderate to mild and including severe traumatic brain injury. There are also regional referral centers for MTBI and resources in multiple different areas of the state. This map shows uh, different areas including the east, west, north, and south portions of the state uh, where specific resources are available as well as the family helpline of the Brain Injury Association of Florida. Thank you.